All right, Sergey, whenever you're ready, thank you so much. And Sergey is, is from one of our great sponsors, Longevity, and we're switching gears a little bit because we're ramping up to our next uh, very exciting uh, and final session of the night, which is the long, uh, the, um, the uh, VC panel. And Sergey is from Longevity. Take it away. <laughs> thank you, Morten. You did, uh, you did your best uh, introducing me. Uh, right. Hello, everyone. I know you're tired. I know it's 8 p.m. Um, we have uh, quite a bit to go, but we're going to talk about investments and we're going to have very exciting 10 minutes together before the VC panel. So I'm Sergey. I'm one of the co-founders and uh, one of the managing partners for Longevity. And Longevity is actually turning two years tomorrow. Um, so before I sort of take you down the memory lane, of how we started, what we do, and what does the longevity investment landscape actually bring to you as a fund. And before I rant about what's good and what's bad and what was challenging, um, I actually want to emphasize that in our business, people are everything. So Longevity was founded by three partners, and that's just sort of a footnote type of information for you. Um, Gary, who you will see in 10 minutes, uh, myself and our third partner, Ilya, as well as Alex, who has kindly agreed to be the head of our advisory board and has provided a uh, huge contribution to the success of the fund so far. Now, again, before we dive into our investment strategy and what's good and bad, I'd really want to um, express sincere gratitude to our scientific advisory board. Now, our scientific advisory board is by far the most important organ of the fund. Um, these are the people that are providing the competencies, um, the, uh, yeah, and the scientific excellence. And the scientific excellence is everything in our industry. So thank you very much for working with us. There, some of you are in the room. Um, we're very grateful. And I would also like to extend these words of gratitude to startups that we have worked with, that we have invested in, uh, that have considered us as an investor, even if we passed, it doesn't mean that the company was bad. It means that it was not for us, right? So thank you very much for trusting in us. And as I said, longevity is two years tomorrow. So it's a bit of a date for us to celebrate. Now, um, with that out of the way, uh, a quick reminder of what we're actually doing at the fund. Now, we're an early stage longevity focused vehicle. For us, it means that we're essentially investing in three major pillars, right? Where we differentiate between therapeutics and non-therapeutics. Now, for the sake of clarity, I've actually uh, divided the non-therapeutics into two additional layers. Now, the therapeutics kind of serves 50% of our time and portfolio allocation. And these are early stage drugs that we as an investor are looking at. Now, mind you, we're looking at age-related diseases which means that we're not investing, consciously not investing in holistic theses of let's make people younger again. That doesn't really work with us. So we are investing in specific disease domains, um, preclinical stage companies, so we come in at preclinical, and we focus on age-related diseases where most of our time is spent in immuno-oncology, neurodegenerative, uh, cellular rejuvenation, and epigenetics. So these happen to be four areas of our specific interest. Now, we then differentiate between diagnostics and prevention, which is, well, how do you catch the disease or diseases early, and I won't stop there, uh, as well as longevity infrastructure. Now, longevity infrastructure is instrumental for our industry. That, that is sort of 20% of our portfolio allocation normally. And this is where we look at technologies that enable faster drug discovery, um, let's say single molecule protein sequencing, um, working with undruggable targets, and, and essentially making the infrastructure ready for us to conduct clinical trials faster, to conduct drug discovery faster, and we'll move faster through drug uh, discovery pipelines. Now, bit of a statistical slide here for you to understand what I'm talking about. So, so far, we have, in two years exactly, we have identified more than 2,000 companies uh, that we have uh, looked at in one way or another. Now, we have spent time evaluating a bit more than 1,000, 1,014, actually, in all of these tracks. So this is like this, the 100% uh, number. Now, we have ended up making 11 investments so far from Fund 1, which gives you roughly a 1% conversion out of the companies we have actually spent time on evaluating. 
uh, to the companies we have ended up uh, deploying capital in. And we, are, we have two deals committed, not yet finalized in terms of the money transfer, pending during the next month. So we'll end up, in the next month, we'll end up with 13 portfolio companies. Now, we will complete 10 additional deals in the next one and a half years, and this is where our official investment period ends for fund one. But this sort of gives you a rough, uh, a rough breakdown on what the conversion rate uh, looks so far. Now, we're super proud of all of these companies, um, and we are pretty famous in the industry for our vigorous due diligence. So all of these have our own um, seal of excellence, uh, if, I, if I may say so, and they, they've all withstood um, the, uh, yeah, the, the scientific roast, really. Um, and uh, six weeks with our deal team, uh, evaluating and, and questioning their science. Now, does the approach work? Yes, it sort of does so far, right? I, I will steal the, the phrase from Tom Brando uh, earlier today, saying we're still kicking the can down the road, right? Um, so we, we don't know yet. So far, performance-wise, we're actually overperforming the top quartile VC funds uh, in biotech. And biotech is not living its best life right now, and I, I know the industry is kind of down. But we're currently at 2.3 uh, cash on cash so far with the existing portfolio companies. Um, our target is 5x cash on cash, so we're still getting there um, as a fund. But this is already pretty decent with zero death rate on the portfolio so far. So everyone is alive, everyone is raising the next rounds and actually demonstrating sort of their next value inflection milestones clinically. Now, um, I wanted to spend a bit of time telling about, well, what are the core elements defining our approach as a longevity-focused fund in general? Um, you find these, might find these obvious, but obvious is very often the ones that are overlooked. So I, I thought, well, I'd sort of re-emphasize those. First, we started with adopting hard definition of longevity. Longevity as a concept is a bit shallow, okay? It's kind of everything and nothing at the same time, and we know it, we all know it, all people in the room, some of us don't admit it, but we, we kind of know what, what, you're, what I'm talking about. Um, so we have focused on longevity as technologies that are providing some sort of targeted extension of health span through tackling age-related diseases, right? So we're age-related disease focused, which means that we invest in things that have clear timelines, clear clinical pipelines, and clear disease indications. We don't invest in holistic theses, and this is something that we use to estimate our exit timelines. As a VC, you cannot really do anything else. I mean, you need to focus on disease areas. Now, we admire the vision of the founders, but we always evaluate the hard variables. And that means we always look at the team, we always look at the capacity of the team to execute and how well balanced the team is. We do not invest in uh, science-only teams. So the scientific founders are great and it's fine if the team lacks entrepreneurial component and if the founders think that it's not important, it is actually one of the most important things on the team. So we would normally pass on these deals, but we would always evaluate how the IP is secured, whether the people behind have understanding of how fast they're going through the market, through the regulatory. Um, what are the disease indications? Are they jumping from one disease indication to another or are they actually sticking to one clinical program and focusing their effort? So all these things actually count. Now, the third one, well, successful investors are known by their rigorous due diligence processes. Uh, we have stuff we're proud of, and this is, well, the scientific excellence we have on board. We have a huge deal team. We have five people on the deal team and then 13 people on the scientific advisory board, as you saw. We also have a bit of a negative statistics to the fund where we actually have track record of uh, rounds that we unfortunately disrupted. Uh, we never lead rounds, but we always assume the lead on the technical due diligence side. And it very often so happens where uh, our tech due diligence actually reveals something that does not allow the lead to proceed with the deal. Um, it is unfortunate for the founders. It is a good thing for the industry because it helps to weed out projects that are not yet scientifically ready um, and sound to be invested. Now, fourth, longevity is not a therapeutics only field. So whenever we talk about longevity, we really need to adopt a wider approach, right? So we really need to think about Prevention, we really need to think about enabling technologies, and we really need to think about therapeutics, but again, targeted therapeutics. 
right? Um, I'm gonna talk, my next slide will be about sort of the focus um, that, that, that we should adopt, but really a lot of longevity companies at this point of time are in a huge identity crisis and that makes them non-investable. Some of the longevity companies that are dealing with longevity specific technologies, um, I know a lot of you know about senescent cells for example, right? Focus, uh, suffer from the fact that it's very hard to pick the disease indication. It is very hard to focus themselves on actually following a specific clinical pipeline, a timeline, um, and well, um, pursuing specific endpoints that they wanna, that they wanna uh, demonstrate, right? So we really want to emphasize that, you know, we we'll look at longevity broadly, but then we always look for a concentrated effort from the company, whatever they're doing. And in our portfolio, we have companies that are looking for early stage cancer screening, uh, that are doing epigenetic group programming, that are uh, providing facilities for single molecule uh, protein sequencing, for example. But all of these are, are targeted efforts and, and we always understand where the science leads and what the product is at the end of the day. Now, fifth and the most important one, the network. This is the biggest resource we can give our portfolio companies and this is something that we strive for. So all of our resource, all of our scientific advisory board, everything is available to our portfolio companies and, and we're always there 24 seven for them. Now, uh, four biggest challenges that we've faced. And this is something for the founders in the room. And again, these might be obvious, they're not obvious. We're seeing this in, in every second company that we look at. Um, so take note, right? A, delayed regulatory understanding and resultant restrictions. I've told about the identity crisis so far, right? And, and this is what I'm talking about. A lot of companies in the longevity space are great as technologies, but they're very hard to focus on one disease indication. And you need to focus on a disease indication to actually get to market, for, to get the IND, and for FDA to approve you, right? So a lot of stuff is there that can improve the life of the patient with some disease condition, but it's not that concentrated to be disease modifying, right? And this is why we see a lot of companies jumping from oncology to IPF to uh, whatever else, right? So to kidney disease, trying to sort of, you know, find their identity and, and basically guesstimate where the technology would work best. And it's a bad case for VCs. VCs don't like it and, and, and we're actually afraid of technologies like this because this is water in the sand, unfortunately, in terms of the capital investment. So. It's a bit of a regulatory problem because regulators do not know how to approach aging companies so far. But yeah, that, it is what it is. Second, uh, Morton, I have one more slide, so bear with me. Um, research expertise uh, is very often not matched with business acumen. Again, um, technical only teams, scientific only teams, unfortunately don't work. They just don't. And, and this is something we need to admit. So from day one, even if you are lab, I mean, very early preclinical, so lab stage, um, you already need to start talking to the industry, right? And this is something that we expect as an investor as well. Um, and, and very often founders don't, don't know it and don't want to admit it. And this is why we see teams that are skewed towards science and neglect the entrepreneurial component, which is, which is not good. Um, third, that's a bit of a pain point, right? So prior overvaluation, where the market was overheated, a lot of companies raised a lot of money at big valuations, but not that much to survive through the winter, right? So a lot of down routes are happening right now. Down routes are good for investors that have dry powder. So we get deals, well, at a cheaper price, right? Because the valuations got slashed. Well, the downside of it is the founders are actually getting so heavily diluted that they lose incentive to continue with their companies. And every third company that we see has raised a huge round before and now raising uh, the one with 50% discount and the founders are left with 15% after, well, still a preclinical or super early clinical round. And that's very bad. And that's unraisable in the next round. So this is something that we're seeing and this is a bit of a blocker. And then last but not least, lack of focus and go to market understanding. I won't stop here um, too much I'll just say, if you're a founder and you are working on a platform technology, which is always great, um, don't attempt approaching investors saying, we have five clinical programs and we're working on all five at the same time, where one is oncology, the second one is IPF, third is kidney, fourth is ophthalmology, fifth is skin, right? Uh, and every single one needs 15 million 
right off the bat, and you were raising 10 all in all, right? Again, it's water in the sand, unfortunately, and, and this is a bit of a red flag for investors so far. Um, yeah, so these are the lessons we've learned, and this is something that we've done um, so far. We have one and a half years from the first fund uh, to still to invest, but ARDD is very like, intimate for us, and, and we have been supporting the event historically. Um, so I'd like to uh, use my last slide, Morton, as an opportunity to do like a very quick soft announcement uh, that, that we're actually launching our second investment vehicle. Um, we haven't announced it officially yet because the first closing did not yet happen, but I just wanted to leave it there uh, in the public space that we're launching on Jevy C2. It's a bigger vehicle. Uh, it's going to be a US-based one. Uh, we are excited and, and we're still humbled to continue to support longevity-focused startups and age-related disease-focused startups um, and founders. With our second fund, it's going to be, it's planned to be a 150 mil um, investment vehicle, so a bit bigger than the first one. And we are going to target clinical rounds now, right? So we're going to target early clinical post IND founders that really need that support to go through phase one into phase two and, and hopefully into acquisition or phase three. Now, with that being said, um, I do appreciate your time today. Again, I know you're tired, um, but uh, yeah, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'd be glad to, to talk after today or the whole day tomorrow. Thank you so much, and uh, see you around.